are going to get started. Um, there will be someone at the Zoom chat very shortly. Let us know. You're very good at letting us know if there's any technical difficulties at all. <laughs> we have had our share. This is our third live and Zoom presentation for the Circle of Life Coalition since, um, since the pandemic when we went all Zoom. My name is Deborah Nicholson. I'm a, the current chair of the Circle of Life Coalition. And um, it's exciting to be able to pivot and use technology and reach more people with our message. Our vision for the Circle of Life Coalition is to provide safe places for folks. But our statement is, we envision an informed community, open to honest conversations about life and death, one in which we inspire each other to live life fully while acknowledging the inevitability of death and where choices for end-of-life care are effectively communicated, documented, respected, and honored. We definitely like to try and live by that and get that message across so that all families can have open and honest communications about what they want for their quality of life. So every month we do have a sponsor. This month it is Comfort Keepers and for a few minutes Mr. Dave Kendall is going to talk to us about what Comfort Keepers can do for people in the community. Thank you, Deborah. You're welcome. Well, we're certainly delighted to be a sponsor of the Circle of Life Coalition. Um, it's just been great to see how it's grown over the last close to, what, 20 years, Gary, is that fair? 13 years incorporated. Uh, Comfort Keepers, for those that are out there on Zoom, know that we're across the nation. So uh, the website that'll be coming up so that you can access our, our information if you so need to or would like to will be one where you can just go to that website and put in your zip code where you may need uh, non-medical home care is kind of the generic of what we do. So we support seniors that want to stay in their own homes. We do a ton of end of life care alongside of the hospice organizations or even if hospice is not involved. So uh, my partner, Jen, and I, this is our 20th year in Berks County, and we're just on fire at this point. And the one thing I'll, I'll tell folks out there, listeners and the folks in the room today, uh, the one piece of advice I have for everybody is get educated and engage extra help sooner rather than later. Most people end up engaging us. And they say, God, I wish we would have done this long ago. Um, there's just an awful lot that we can do to support families not just the individual that needs the help, but the entire family taking some of the burden off their back, allowing them to play the pr most probably noble role that they can. And that might be loving wife, it might be spouse, it might be sister or brother, or whatever that relationship is. It allows you to back away from the hands-on care and really focus on the most important things toward the end of life. So again, thank you very much for allowing us to be a sponsor today. And I'll turn it back over to Deborah. Oh, thank you. And we'll get on with our speaker, I guess, next. Is that right? Yeah. I'm okay, super. Do you, I have a question for you, though. Do oh, I sure. Are there have some special training at the Center of Life Care? Yeah, we, we train folks in a skills lab uh, at our office. So we have everything set up that you might see in a pretty advanced home care setting. It looks almost more like a hospital room where we do our training. Uh, my staff give me a hard time when I say we have a training dummy. They say, no, it's a mannequin. And uh, <laughs> they get actual hands-on, one-on-one training uh, up to and including personal care skills. And then we do have different uh, pieces that we allow folks to go through, one of which is you know, a higher level of hospice training, uh, congestive heart failure, COPD, Parkinson's, all kinds of things. So we really do have a career path available for our caregivers. And being in the business 20 years, we still have caregivers that are with us for more than 10. So we have a pretty good uh, group of folks that can mentor new people. And did you have anything else you'd like me to, no, to share with you? No, Deborah? that All was, right. I was, I thought that you did. I yeah. wanted you to mention okay. that you could to know Thank what you so type much. of education that you're on. Um, Thank you. Good to see everybody. Thank you. 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 Definitely go check out that link. If everyone please mute their microphone, we're going to scroll now. I can hear somebody chewing. 
That would be great. Meet yourselves. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to introduce our speakers. We have with us today to discuss surviving a parent's worst nightmare. Donald Schulk is currently Director of Business and Corporate Development, Development at Alvernia University. Prior to working at the university, he was in management for 43 years at senior level positions. He retired to complete his career by giving back and achieving a goal of teaching. He serves on several boards. Mary Schalk, his wife, is a registered nurse who has ser served in several capacities for 45 years. She currently works in a family practice in Wine Missing. The Schalks have been married for 45 years and have four sons and nine grandchildren. They are very active in the church also. Um, so we are very pleased to welcome them here to help us um, understand their journey. <clears throat> Good, good morning. Um, I guess this is a, a first. I, I think uh, I was mentioned this morning that you've never had two speakers at the same time. So we'll have to navigate this uh, a little bit. But um, when Wendy Kirshner asked if I would tell our story, um, I thought about it for a little bit and um, decided that my wife needed to be a part of this conversation. Um, and the reason is, is that um, research shows that when uh, you lose a child, 80% of the marriages end up in separation or divorce. And um, one of the things that we were committed to was that we were not going to let that happen to us. Um, but I think what's important and what we want to talk about in this discussion, hopefully um, some nuggets will come out for you, is that um, we both grieve differently. And we'll discuss that. Um, this will be a conversational discussion. We don't have any slides or anything like that. Um, it's not structured or polished because this is the first time we've ever done it. So we're going to talk from the heart. And uh, any questions you have, um, there's no, no limit. You can ask us anything you would like. Um, one thing, too, that I would say is that um, this time of the year, uh, recently the Reading Eagle had an article about um, grief uh, during the holidays. And it's a very, very difficult time. And uh, uh, this is a difficult time for us as a family, even though it's been uh, over 27 years. The, um, the reason I say that is our son passed away on January 24th. And the month before, he was the Santa Claus in the Christmas play. And, and our family has a family tradition of uh, each one of us uh, rotates and puts the baby Jesus in the manger. And the year he passed, before he passed away, he did that. Um, so we kind of, after Thanksgiving start, and uh, kind of relive that journey every year. Uh, so, so those are just some opening remarks. Um, again, as uh, uh, Deborah announced or mentioned, uh, we've been married 45 years. Um, we met. Um, Mary was a, a freshman nursing student at St. Joe's in uh, Syracuse, New York, uh, which was affiliated with Lemoyne College. I had just graduated. Um, we told our kids we met in the library. Uh, we believed that for 18 years because we actually did. It was the watering hole in Syracuse, New York, for college kids. Um, we had five sons. Uh, our first son came in 1978. And um, our last sons came in 1982. We had three kids in one year, uh, Teddy in January and identical twins in December. I was audited by the IRS. Um, but uh, we, we operated very closely as a unit. Um, Mary is like uh, General Patton. Um, we moved very, uh, you know, all together all at once and, uh, and such. You know, my career was mentioned. Um, I was a senior executive for 43 years, traveled a lot. Um, um, and, and now, as, as was mentioned, I work at Alvernia. It's an opportunity for me to give back. Um, and I'll kind of tell you at the end how and why I got here and why it's kind of divine providence of how I ended up here and how we actually ended up in Reading. So I'll turn it over to my wife, Mary, and she can make some comments about herself. 
Oh, oh you covered that. I think we're good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take us all. We don't have slides, but I am using props because I'm a visual learner. And I think you take some of this away from you today. You'll see why. January 24th was just a normal, typical day. We were getting ready to go to work. Our life was pretty sane, normal, neat. Had a stable marriage, had five healthy kids, had good jobs. Um, we got up, Don had, was working um, an hour and a half. He was over in the Rochester area, so we had a good hour and a half commute mostly, most days. In January, you never knew with Lake Effect snow. I remember it being a sunny day. Um, I had two part-time jobs. I worked three days a week at the school where the kids went. It was a Catholic school. And two days a week, I worked at Lemoyne College, a Jesuit school in Syracuse in their health office. That particular day, it was a Monday, I was working at Lemoyne. So uh, the twins and Teddy said, would you please drop us off? We don't want to take the bus. It's too cold. Sure. They three of them piled in the car. Teddy was in sixth grade and the twins were in fifth. Um, everybody, I was always got your book bag, got your gym clothes, got this, got that. In the car we go, drive to school, normal day. Teddy happened to be in the front seat, the twins in the second. They all, it's, most of you can understand this, that now at schools you have a drop-off line. And it's like a Congo line of cars. You pull up, you, pull, you drop your kids off and they go, I pull up, the twins are out of the car, bye mom, bye mom. And Teddy, for some reason, seemed to be awkward getting, and you think back the fine points of a given day, that got everything together, gets out of the car. And for some reason, I, there was no one behind me tooting their horn for me to move along. He stopped, which he, and I usually would have just pulled off after we all say goodbye, I love you. And he paused, turned around and smiled and waved big. And you don't remember that until you do have to remember. And off we go on that given day. So I'll let Don go from there. Yeah, my day is, as Mary mentioned, um, at the time I was working in Rochester because um, I had left my previous employer to uh, get some uh, work experience with an international company. Um, and that's where the office was. I was, uh, and I traveled a lot throughout the U.S., Mexico, and Canada. Um, I was on my way home, you know, it was probably four o'clock in the afternoon. And those of you who are old enough to remember, um, you don't have the technology, you didn't have the technology that, that we have today. Actually, I had the car phone in the bag and um, the, uh, the uh, reception on that was spotty at best. And, um, you know, on my way home, I received a call from my son, my oldest son, Joe, saying that um, Teddy had um, uh, been taken uh, in an ambulance to um, the hospital. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that, uh, and I was still probably at that time, probably an hour away from home, so. I got, um, I worked at the college, drove my car, I quickly ran to the store, came in the driveway, it was about 4.30, maybe 20 minutes to 5, Joe came, our oldest son, who was then in, um, he would have been, Joe would have been, oh, I don't know, ninth or 10th grade, he, 10th grade, he came running out the door, mom, mom, Teddy collapsed at gym, at basketball practice, they're taking him in an ambulance, you got to get to the school, and at that point, I wasn't sure, well, is he at the school still or, or is he in, you know, already at going to the hospital? I drove as fast, I never drove so fast in my life, got to the, to the school, literally jumped at park where I shouldn't, jumped out, ran in and um, I, the ambulance was by the gym door. I ran in and I saw that them working on him, probably where Sister Shauna is, that this was the entrance to the gym. And I started to go in that direction. And somebody said, no, don't go over there. Don't go over there. And you're, at, at that point, you're starting to go into like total shock and panic because you're not sure what's happening. I got a little bit closer and then realized I looked at his body and as an RN, it was lifeless. And I just said, the person was still trying to get it married, Mary. I said, he's gone. And they said, no, he's not. No, he's not. Come, come with me. So Finally, they get him in a stretcher. We get in the ambulance. I had to, and I don't even think you can do this anymore. I sat up front with the driver. The EMT was the back. At that point, I'm looking at my watch. Anybody who's in the medical field at all know how many minutes it takes before somebody is brain dead. I'm looking at my watch. 
I'm then constantly, as we start this journey toward the hospital, we went to Upstate Medical. Um, I'm looking over my shoulder at that monitor. I couldn't see Ted because he was behind the little alcove. I saw his feet. I, I kept looking up at the monitor. Nothing's happening in my mind. I'm what I'm. I, I'm doing this, and I'm praying like I never prayed. We stopped. There was one other firehouse just before we got on the little interstate section we had to go on. They stopped at a firehouse. Another EMT hopped in the back, and the two of them then started a more aggressive form, I guess, of, of hopefully resuscitating Ted. I'm still looking at the clock. We are now 10, maybe a seven, eight, 10 minute drop to the hospital. I can clearly remember at this point in time, it's almost five, if not a little after. I, on my right, you could see it at maybe right off the interstate was a stone, stone quarry. I remember looking at that and in my heart, and I look back over that monitor and at this point, I had to give him to God. And I had a prayer and I said, God, if he cannot come back 100%, where he was full of life, I don't want him to be, um, I think it was Karen Ann Quinlan back in the 70s who was a vegetable. I said, do not bring my son to be a vegetable. I don't like this decision, but I am giving it back to you. You decide. So from that five minutes later, we're pulling into the, uh, the hospital. We are, um, I am basically taken by the EM, the driver took me by the hand or arm and led me one way. Ted Stretcher went the other. And that was the last I saw of him at that time. I was taken to a waiting room that was, if you're ever taken to a room that has upholstered furniture and lots of boxes of peanuts, it's not going to end well. It's going to be critical or disastrous. I was all by myself awaiting his arrival. Yeah, she, Mary called me and just said, you know, in a very short conversation, hurry, you need to get here very quickly. Um, you know, I, I got to the ER, actually pulled up, didn't park my car, just got out of it and ran and, um, you know, met her um, in the private room, um, you know, very shortly, um, you know, several doctors and nurses came in and they told us that, that Teddy had passed. Um, they did allow us um, to go into um, the room that he was in for one last look. Um, and all I remember about that is how cold it was. And, um, you know, we gave him, we gave him, you each gave him a hug. Uh, and the thing that, you know, probably for me, the earthquake was, is that they gave me a grocery bag and I said, what is this? And they said, it's his sneakers in his jersey. And, um, you know, it, you know, it, in my mind, I just kind of said, wow, you know, that's it, you know, that's it. Um, so we, you know, they also asked us to sign uh, autopsy papers. Um, and then um, I just remember uh, with Mary, our drive home, it was silent. Neither one of us said anything. I think the earthquake analogy about, um, I think it was August of 2011, I was giving an EKG, doing an EKG on a patient in our office. And I was kind of like the windowsill was there. I was between the table and that windowsill. And all of a sudden, the whole building started to shake and your knees go wobbly and you feel dizzy. And you, I first, I thought I was fainting. I thought it was me and I didn't realize what was happening. I would have to say that moment in that brief time in August of 11, I think it was, because I researched it. It was like a, something happened in Richmond, but we felt it, felt it up here. That was the closest I could describe physically when we walked into that room. I mean, the finality of seeing your son, your 12-year-old son, dead on a gurney, lifeless. Um, and the room was cold, and it was... It was um, very dimly lit. I remember that. And it was, I almost felt like we were kind of in a war, we kind of, you know, but it was still a room. Um, I think I, my knees wobbled. I felt all at the same time, your head is spinning. You're sick to your stomach. You feel like you're going to soil yourself. Your knees are kind of kind of go like this. And you feel as if you uh, like, that's what it felt like an earthquake. I mean, in your own personal life. So this nice neat life went out the window. It was gone just gone and you had and and you just didn't know 
how you were going to get through or what you should, you were you were in shock i think and you got home and then yeah when we got home it, you know it, you know usually you'd get home and kids were spread out all over the place but um it went when we came through the front door we had the stairway to go up the stairs they were all sitting there and said where's Peg?" and you know we had to tell them that um he pa had passed away um our pastor and the assistant pastor were there um you know, and Father Carmola, who, you know, we'll talk more about him, but walked us through that journey. But, um, you know, we we started to see neighbors come and, you know, uh, you know, comfort us and such. And uh, and such, you know, I, you know, and, and at, at that time for me, you know, I just kept going over in my mind, you know, what didn't I see? You know, what, what was there something I should have seen about, you um, you know, his condition or, you know, and such. I mean, he was a, he was like an energizer bunny. And, you know, it just, it just took me by, took me by total surprise. Um, this is kind of describes from the moment we came home, what our life became. It became unraveled at best. Um, you, you were in it, you were in, a, you were like, you were on a trip and you've never been to this country and it's very scary. And it's like, how are we going to get through this? What have you? Back in 1988, um, fashion designer, socialite, Gloria Vanderbilt lost her 23 year old son. Years later, she was asked about losing a child and she said something very profound. She said, it doesn't change you. It demolishes you. The rest of your life is spent on another level. That is, I cut that out of a Parade Magazine article several years ago, and I thought, I, it, no, no truer words were, 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 could be spoken. And of course, I don't know if anybody, you don't want anybody to ever understand those words. You don't, even your worst enemy. You wouldn't want them to go through what you just are going through. Um, the next day, um, is when uh, the tsunami hit. Uh, and I use that expression because it was a, a massive wave. Uh, there was a, we opened the front door, newspaper there. I had no idea. The front page story, top of the page was about our son's death. So I thought it, 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 social media wasn't around. We, there was no Instagram. And I'm thinking, and people did actually subscribe to the newspaper back in the day. And I thought, well, gosh, we can't hide, can we? This everybody's going to know this. There's, there's, this is, you know, and it it took on a life of its own. The doorbell started ringing. I, people were at the door. There were flowers. There was food. There were people coming and going all day long. I'm one of eight. Don's one of five. We had great our parents to deal with, and um, and our kids. And I think the most, the thing for me was just how do we the wave of assault was just coming at us left and right in terms of the events you had to uh, you're being told got to call the undertaker got to go pick out a casket got to figure out what he's going to be laid out in you have to um you know we met with our pastor and the people from church to plan a funeral mass all the you know pick out the what what songs what readings it it sounds kind of easy but it's a lot all at once to try to bring honor to not just your sweet son, but to your faith. Um, we, we've always been strong in our faith. And man, this event taught us you just can't talk the talk, you've got to walk it. And so we had to kind of hold together uh, to make that happen. Two movies, though, if you, if you want to catch, if you never have, one is called The Hereafter with Matt Damon. And it was from, I think, the, like maybe 2000. I had it written down when it was, but 2010. And, the, and that was loosely based on the tsunami that hit Indonesia on Christmas Day um, back in, the, in 2004. The other one was a true story about a family separated during that tsunami, and that was called The Impossible. Um, the visual effects of that tsunami happening and what you see in those movies is powerful because that is what it feels like at the first week or so after the death. And you're just, you, you cannot, you are being... You are under a wave. You cannot get to the top. You cannot you feel like your chest is pressuring? You can't breathe. You simply can't breathe. 
Um, and so that, I would recommend those movies. I mean, don't watch them on Christmas Day or anything, but I mean, they're powerful in terms of if you want a physical of like a newly bereaved person is going to. Yeah, as Mary mentioned, um, uh, the, uh, we, we received almost a thousand letters from all over, you know, from college basketball teams to uh, politicians and such. Um, and the support was for me, you know, it's a tsunami that the challenge I have, we're, we're very different people, you know, from emotional areas or whatever. You know, I'm from the, uh, the German side. And, uh, it's, it's, you know, my, my parents were not huggers and, and such. And, you know, so that, you know, and those two different personalities played a major role in how we, how we walked our way through this or, and navigated through it. I mean, the biggest challenge for me was, um, you know, I felt that I couldn't grieve because I had to be a role model for my kids um, and, and that they couldn't really um, see see that maybe I was falling apart. I had to compartmentalize things. Um, I was pretty good at that because as a, as a business leader, um, you learn to compartmentalize things because sometimes you you have to make difficult decisions that impact people. And you know, my dad always told me, you know, if you try to make everybody happy in business, you never you make no one happy. Um, so it, uh, you know, that was a that was hard for me because I felt I had to be a role model, and I really couldn't share my my grief. Um, you know, so uh, you know, again, the first couple of weeks, you know, there was tremendous community support and. You know, we were surrounded by this bubble and, and such. Um, you know, but then all of a sudden, two weeks later, everybody left, and you're alone. I would say I brought bubble wrap because that is what I feel God put us in. The first few weeks, you're going, through, you're on automatic pilot, and how you know you say to yourself years later, how the heck did we make? Why did we pick that outfit out for him to be laid out in, or why did we do this, or why? Well, you did what you did, and you were in bubble wrap. And thank God, I, I always tell my wrap a package in bubble wrap. I always say thank you, God, for bubble wrap and what it can do for us um, in, in the metaphor of it, uh, because we, we there's no way you could just survive it without feeling a little bit insulated. Um, I read a quote, another quote that I've since liked. Um, it said, "Devastation is what loss leaves behind," and this was what you did. We, I still felt this. And yet I felt that we would get through it. I cried after Teddy. At several points, I cried at the hospital. I cried at home. We went to bed that night, I cried. Um, but I didn't sob. I never really had one of those things where um, you drop down on the ground and you sob in a fetal position. I never, I did, well, not right away at least. I did not have it. That would come later. Um, and, and it, we somehow, um, at the funeral mass, we that the wake was Ted died on a Monday. The wake was thir uh, the wake was Thursday evening, and it was practically an ice storm that night. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't believe even the even the undertaker said, "I did, I don't believe the number of people that came out in this weather to come to this wake." Yeah, uh, the next day was sunny but cold, um, and uh, the funeral mass was. Absolutely beautiful, and we, uh, what surprised me was all of a sudden I realized that Channel Channel Five is over there, and Channel Nine is over there. That they had actually brought somebody there just to film part of the part of the funeral mass for a clip. And I, you're you're still kind of going like, this is not happening. But I, this is somebody else's life. This is not mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if, you know, after two weeks, I mean, I had to go back to work. Um, you know, and I was traveling a lot. You know, I would go to Rochester here some Mondays and Fridays, but the other three days I was on an airplane. Um, you know, I was in Grand Rapids, Michigan, or Boise, Idaho, or San Francisco, or Toronto, Canada. You know, and, um, you know, I was managing a large a group of people, and, you know, obviously, uh, you know, had very little time to breathe. I mean, the tsunami for me was 
um, going back to the hotel at night they flown. Um, and not, you know, I mean, they had families and, you know, you, you weren't, weren't going out to dinner with a lot of people and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, that was difficult for me. I mean, and, and you know, one of the things that I learned is in, in people, I think people that are interacting with you don't understand. Um, I felt like a leper. No one really wanted to talk to me because they were afraid that if they touched me, the same thing might happen to them. Um, and really what, um, you know, what, you know, I wanted to do was to talk about it. Did they know my son? Could they tell me a story about him that would make me smile? Um, you know, still to this day, you know, it's, well, it'll be 28 years in January. Um, I still will tear up you know, on a song or a holiday or um, an event, movies that he liked. Um, you know, it, it, you learn to live with it, but it, it never quite goes away. And, um, you know, uh, for me, you I mean, for me, the difficulty and the thing that we've done well, we'll talk about it a little bit, but you I mean, there's the fear that you're, that he'll be for you know, you don't want um, you don't want that to happen. Um, uh, you know, so it, I mean, I know some of you are you know work and talk with folks. I mean, when you're when it, you, you you need to be encouraged to, to to have the person talk about it because they have to talk about it to 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 begin that healing process, and uh, you know. And, and I think too, you know, as, as I went back to working with Come Home, you know, we we grieved differently. You know, there were days when I'd be up and she'd be down. And there'd be days she'd be up and I'd be down. You know, and you know, there was there's issues there with um, anger, um, you know, frustration or whatever you want to call it. So, I would say, you know, once the initial tsunami subsided. I would say that the next several years, there's no timeline. Like, oh, you, you know, they usually say, oh, you're pretty much over in three years for a spouse or, or one year if it's an older parent. I don't think there's a timeline for any grief experience. I think it's it's truly um, uh, yeah, it's not, to, not to interrupt, I can remember six months into it, someone came to me and said, well, it's over, I can't move on. There were people who felt, um, you know, I, I at two years, someone said, you know, it's been two years and I, and I, you want it, you just want to scream in their face when they, when they, um, I don't want to say that they didn't do it. And, and I don't fault anybody. If you've never done it, you don't know what you're saying. And if they think they're helping or they're trying to be a cheerleader, come on, win one for the Gipper. Well, sorry, that, that, that game is, that, that's over there. My normal life is over there. Um, the, I would say as the years went on, you would have um, what I, I used to say, high tide, low tide days. And every once in a while, you'd get hit by a rogue wave and you never saw, you didn't see it coming. You'd be five years out and all of a sudden you would pivot and something would happen or you'd run into Teddy's best friend somewhere. He was off in college and you're standing there like ready to just like sob. And then you, you, you play nice and then you get in the car and you sob. Um, those kinds of events happen. And then you would have low tide days where somebody could say his name and you would smile and it didn't, it didn't incapacitate you for the rest of the day. Um, one thing that, you know, people did say, ask us very early on, like, were you on something? And I, at first I was like, even as a nurse, I was like, what do you mean? As well, did they give you some, you know, are you on any kind of anxiety pills or depression pills? I said, well, no, the only thing I've been on is my knees to pray. Cause I said, I don't have time to numb this. I have to just deal with what's in front of me. I had four other kids. I was afraid to take anything that would numb me or um, affect my ability to then continue on. I'm not saying that that is not a place for that. In our world as a nurse, I know there is. We all have different coping styles and methods, but that was just for me at the time. Now that I think about it, I don't think any doctor ever came over and asked me that. Our family doctor even was... He was our, a parishioner. He didn't even ask me that. And I, at the time, I'd be like, I don't even have time for that. Um, but we were, um, we kind of did it our, ourselves, though, as the story goes on, it wasn't necessarily pretty. 
Um, the grief waves for us, I think our marriage, um, I'm not afraid to say it, we, we struggled as a married couple. We started to drift a little bit because I was on automatic pilot. He was traveling a lot. I had my job as a mom, my job as a nurse. You know, I had to maintain, um, I wanted to maintain, that's the, the Irish in me. I wanted to maintain that I was, we were going to all be okay. Moms and Chuck, mom and dad got this. We're all going to be, in, you know, okay. Though so he was gone most of the time. I don't know whether there was a part of me. I used to see, well, good. You can be in a hotel room and sob your eyes out if you want to. I don't have that place to go. It's right in the same house. I don't have that privacy to grieve, like maybe the way I think I should. But my kids saw, our kids saw nothing but two parents that were intact and yet we knew on some level we were we our level of, of intimacy as a couple was kind of like we were over we were drifting and it was hard we both knew it and yet we couldn't kind of figure out how we were going to navigate back you know what you know from the, the healing side um you know what helped me and you know i, I used to wonder when i was at lemoyne it was a jesuit school we had to take 15 hours of philosophy and 15 hours of theology. Um, I wondered why, but that, that helped me a lot. And, and the other thing that uh, I did, and I know Mary did as well, is we did a lot of reading um, of books. You know, I wanted to understand my feelings to make sure that I wasn't going nuts. Um, you know, so I read as much as I could and kind of reflected and you know back on you know my my philosophy and and uh, my my theology courses um you know and you know i we had, i had i would have a, a faith discussion with with our pastor father carmola in syracuse on a monthly basis um and that that helped me a lot um you know and i i over time i chose to choose anger or or I, I could have chose anger, but I chose gratitude. And, and I did that because I, I reflected, and it took me a while to say that, well, I could be angry, but the 12 years that we had them were the best 12 years of my life. And, um, you know, I, 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 I reflected on that, you know. Um, you know, the things that I learned, I think, um, out of that is that, and I think my family has learned that, you know, our kids have learned that um, at a very early age, his life is fragile. Um, a family, family priority is more important than your job. You know, my career, um, I immediately came, but left and, and, and didn't want to travel as much as I did anymore and came back. And, you know, the good Lord blessed me with still tremendous career advancement and opportunities, but, you know, my family was first, you know, I didn't want to miss any more basketball games or soccer games or Christmas plays or whatever, because I was out of town. Um, and, and I learned to, to be in the moment, you know, the future is important, but to, to, to be in the moment, um, you know, uh, you know, and I think as a, as a leader, as a business person, uh, I became much more sensitive to people, you know, you know, that everybody experiences loss, whether it's a job, divorce, uh, addiction, a lot of different things. And, you know, before, if per, for example, if someone had a performance problem, you know, it was very focused towards business. But from her, one of the things that I learned um, was she would always say, did you ask him if anything's going on at home? And, and I learned as well to be a leader, not only to, to lead and understand them as an employee, but to understand them as a person and understand what might be going on. And, um, you know, that served me very well. Um, you know, and, and, you know, in the, in the bio, uh, the give back, um, you know, I look at, I look at our faith. And um, I think it's divine providence that that we got sent to Reading. Um, what we didn't say is that our kids went to a Catholic school, and um, they were they were taught by Franciscan nuns. 
And those nuns helped us as part of that process with our pastor. And um, as a result of that, um, you know, I made a commitment that um, at the end of my career, I would give back. And where did we end up? Reading, and guess who's here? The Franciscan nuns. Um, you know, and it's why I uh, came to work at Alvernia. I was a trustee before I came to work, but um, you know, the sisters, the sisters mean a lot to me because they, they, on, on my journey, they helped, they helped, um, helped me, um, at least heal somehow. As our journey went on, I'm going to kind of go back a little bit because I, I think he was able with his career to move along a little bit better on the grief, uh, journey than I was. I, I think as his mom, as a nurse, uh, autopsy would show that he had been born with a congenital heart defect. Nobody saw it. And they didn't do sonograms back when I had babies. They didn't. They would have picked that up if, if that had been part of the routine care that young women now get. Um, as the years, as you know, the first year goes by, the second year, and you start to go from this to this. You start to have very manageable days and days you're kind of like that. And then slowly this becomes more of your life. Um, and yet you can have a, a, a day when one of the strings starts to come unraveled a little bit, but then you get yourself in control again. And then you say, I'm going to be okay. It's been five years. It's been six years. Um, what have you at the five year, five and a half year mark, uh, his co company that he worked for was kind of going uh, out of business. So he took a job the first time we came to Reading. And uh, I had to leave the house that we had all our memories of Teddy in. And that was a house of 15 years. Um, I felt like, where's that? I felt like a tangled mess again. I had, we had to say goodbye to that. I lost all my female support systems. We didn't have social media where you could be constantly just even sending a, a nice text to people. But, um, I lost that. And he gets here, goes right to work every day, and I'm unpacking, trying to make a house. And I have the twins were still with us. They weren't to holy name. They were halfway through their junior year. That went over really well with them. So then I'm dealing with them, <laughs> being mad at us, me being mad at him. It was just not a good scene. It really was a tangled mess again. But we all got through it. We maintained, you know, one of them wanted to stay with friends in Syracuse and graduate from there. I said, get in the car. You're not staying behind. You're a unit. You're not, you know, I had to do, I had to be the, the Irish mom and like, like over my dead body, you're staying behind. So we get here. Um, and to tell you the truth, they would even say that Holy Name was a blessing to them. Um, I was the one that was, uh, did struggle. What um, happened for me um, the twins then graduate from high school holy name in August of 2001. Um, they go off to college and we, we now have an empty nest. And I was almost, it's funny because even when our oldest went off to college, we would drive up and I was, and he went to St. Joe's in Philly. It's so funny. Our kids ended up at colleges in PA and he goes, um, we drop them off and all these parents, the moms are sobbing, like as their kids are, they're pulling away. And I'm, we pull away and I said, Devon, why is everybody crying? This is how it's supposed to be. Your kid's supposed to live and go to college, not die at 12. So, you know, and I wanted to roll down the window and go, stop crying. You know, it's, this is okay. You know, they're supposed to go to college. They weren't at college two weeks and 9-11 happened. I was now um, seven and a half years into my journey and I was still holding on to pain, to guilt, to anger. Um, I sat in the living room, he was at work. Again, the, the, the cell phones were even better than they are now, but I watched tower one go down, tower two go down. And I sat there all by myself and I threw myself on the ground in my living room and I sobbed seven and a half years worth of tears and not just for me I was sobbing for every parent every spouse every child every sibling every friend who was watching 
their tsunami, their earthquake. All I could feel is my heart ached for every single family affected because I knew what was ahead of them. And it was being played out in such a horrific public way. I had an epiphany. I was just remember laying there saying, Mary, you're not the only person who's ever going to lose a loved one. And it's time you deal with it. And so I will look at 9-11 when someone says, how can something good come out of something so horrid? They forced me to kind of finally say, how am I gonna, how am I gonna work through this? How am I gonna get this pain out of my life? But Don didn't say, and God bless you for not saying it. I gained like 45, 50 pounds after Teddy died. He never said one word. Probably he knew why he didn't say one word. <laughs> I, it, of course, this is September 11th, and it took a couple of, and then we, uh, shortly thereafter, you know, we were facing the holiday season. I remember that Christmas of 2001, just sitting there looking at the manger and just feeling, I just said, I'm tired of this, this, what I'm doing. This is not working for me. And I said, I'm not starting, I'm not gonna be in the same spot a year from now. I am not gonna feel this way. I, I, I have to do this better. And that's why I say to everybody here, healing is a choice. You have to make a point, at some point you have to say enough. I, I am going to heal from this. That may include going to a support group. That might include medication. That might include uh, just one-on-one -on -one therapy yourself. If you're not, not everybody's into group therapy. They'd rather meet one-on-one -on -one with a therapist or a counselor. But I think, and for me, one thing I did do very early on, I forgot to mention this, I began to journal uh, about a month after Teddy died. And I journaled for a good 10 years. And finally, at that 10 year mark, I was able to say, I'm done. I've said all I can say. Um, I still have those journals and someday I will reread them. I just have never done that. Um, I, starting in February, January, January, maybe it was after the anniversary of his death in 2002, I started to take better care of myself. I got my nurse's license in Pennsylvania. I went back to work. I started uh, working out. I started eating healthier and I did lose the 40 or 50 pounds I gained. I resumed, I threw away all the fat clothes and I got back to where I was. And um, uh, it, for us, um, I think we, I got to a point where I felt like we were, we grew close, we started to reconnect. Um, I found me again and I couldn't, happiness is an inside job. He couldn't fix me. Um, there's no, no one person that's going to, at the end of the day, no matter how many helpful people are around you, what you join or do or read, you had to fix it yourself. And, um, that's kind of where I think we came to, mm -hmm. to that. It's interesting in, in kind of pulling some thoughts together. I didn't know this, but the PSTD was an, a post stress, or it was a post traumatic stress, PTSD. Yeah. Is that? Mm -hmm. Yep. It, it came out during the Vietnam War. Um, and I didn't know the history of it. When I researched, I found that interesting. And it didn't really get officially acknowledged by the American Psychiatric Association until 1980. And it is often described as um, someone, sh anyone um, is showing a reaction to an extraordinary event outside the usual realm of human experience. And I said, to, when, I, when I read that, I said, hmm. I think that's pretty much that kind of that's kind of what we did, and that's kind of what I know I went through. So the I mean, the other thing from a healing perspective, um, you know, when I, when I talked about the fact that we didn't want to be forgotten, is we celebrate his life every year. Um, you know, we have uh, you know we have birthday cake, um, you know, uh, such um, you know the holidays, you know, and special occasions. I mean, there is that void, obviously. I mean, when and it, whenever you have an event, there's always something missing, um, and then and that still hurts. Some you, you always wonder, you know, how would he have grown up? You know, who would he have married? How many kids would he have had? That sort of thing. But um, you know, it it's heartwarming to hear our grandkids tell stories about Teddy, because his brothers have kept that alive and. Um, you know, for me, and it's unusual, you know, my four sons, um, they'll call me every day and they'll ask me how I'm doing. 
because they understand um, the, the fragile uh, portion of life. And uh, I mean, those calls are, you know, the Philly State or the Eagles need a new quarterback or some, some crazy thing, but it's just a way to connect. And um, the thing that I admire most about Barry is that she, when someone dies that we know, she will send a card to them keeps track on our calendar, the anniversary of that death, sends them a card, might even send something to them on Father's Day or Mother's Day, um, just to, just to um, fill that void that, that we, we learned about, that, um, you know, that it's important for those people to know that somebody cares and that somebody remembers them. Um, and you know it's a it's a wonderful touch, and uh, you know I get ten birthday cards, she gets one hundred and eighty. Uh, you know because of that. But, uh, <laughs> He's exaggerating <laughs> by at least eighty. <laughs> I'm only kidding. But um, you know I think the healing part to, that it, for me, you know, I, and I think you know, I think for her as well is that um, keeping that memory alive. Um, and hearing those stories and you know having the next generation understand what he was like and funny stories, I think, um, uh, is a wonderful way, I think, as well to, to heal. I think I look at anyone who's at home watching or the people here in the room, um, you all, not even just professionally, but personally, you're going to have that opportunity to, to help someone else. And if anything was said today, um, helps you to help them, then I'm grateful because that's how we honor Teddy and that's how we honor our faith. We honor our journey. I said, after all was said and done, you end up making something that you can actually wrap around yourself and you're comfortable. You're not afraid to talk about it. You're not afraid to come alongside somebody and put your arm around them and say, I'm here. And I think, I think that's the most important thing. Um, you know, in, in the last uh, quote, I think that, you know, our pastor told us, um, and it's a quote from Ram Das, is, in the end, we're, we're just walking each other home. And that's that's what we're supposed to do. So thank you for your time. Thank you. And any questions, any questions? Or feel free. We're, nothing's off the table, really. We've been through it all. This, we buried a child, so you can talk about anything. <laughs> Yes, please keep entering your um, comments into the chat. Are there any questions within the room or comments at all within the room here? Okay. So there was a couple of, of folks who were just like, thank you for sharing such a personal story. Um, it does help us to understand that grieving doesn't stop. That was a comment in the in the chat, and absolutely. And that's part of what we do here. We provide some grief presentations and resources for grief on our Circle of Life Coalition website, .org. Said Spirit um, <clears throat> definitely has some newsletters that have good grief resources, and also providing the safe space. When they said anything's on the table, that anything's on the table with us too, as far as questions related to to grieving, living, surviving, beyond this. I, I personally, those analogies were good. It's, it's so true, you know, whether it's the death, sudden death of a child, a spouse, or that suddenness is so earth shattering and the tsunami afterward. I can't imagine the media, yikes. Uh, how long did it take for them to go away 27 years ago? <laughs> um. They later they even did an article in the New York Times about his, oh, his wow. passing. I mean, okay. what was interesting at the time was he collapsed and died of a heart attack, and then a week or ten days later, another uh, high school uh, basketball player did the same thing. And they talked about how often that happened in, in the process that we went through. That's just. Don't know how you cope with that, but um, probably with as much grace as you have through this whole journey. One of our board members is watching and commented that um, 
she had lost her sister um, when she was 14 years old and her parents couldn't cope, so they were separated the rest of the family. But they came back later and are healing together on that continuous journey. So it's not too late. It's not too late to reach out for help and guidance and support. Sister. Uh, I just, it'd be helpful to me how to express our condolences. Uh, people say, I'm sorry for your loss. Somewhere, somehow that just doesn't set well with me, like you lost your keys. You know, so what can you suggest that cause alternatives? Thank you. It's That's a hard one because I think um, your loss is um, so deep and so profound and so personal. Um, I truly, and I know um, that I sometimes think we are, we're at a loss, but we're human and we're like, oh God, oh my God, here she comes, oh my God, what am I gonna say? And it just, that it does seem to be our default mode. I'm so sorry for your loss, I'm so sorry for you. I even said it to you earlier, you shared about your wife. I said, I'm so sorry. And I am because I think, oh gosh, you know, the thought, you, I, I think it comes from a point of grace, but I think it's just say to someone, Instead of, I, you know, I, I heard the news. I'm here. I need you. You know, what, can, what would you be willing if I brought coffee over someday? Because going out in public, sometimes you don't want to have a, a cry match out in public. You'd rather be in somebody's home or need in a neutral, well, be, even on a park bench. It's not as public as like Starbucks. I think that that's important. Mm -hmm. if, if you want to still maintain their sense of privacy. I, and, um, but. Yeah, I mean, I think the other thing that, you can do is ask how the person's doing, you know, because if you ask how they're doing, then that would get them to talk about what, right. what they want to, and, you know, uh, you know, maybe engage in a conversation of ask, you know, do you have a funny story to tell about or something that you remember my loved one by? Mm -hmm. But if you, if you ask, how are you doing, it, it kind of flips that. Yeah, and asking permission, or not to interject a little bit, ask permission, is it okay if I ask you to tell a story? Because it might not be a good day for that story. And sometimes wishing for all that they need during this time. I started to say that, I don't know. It felt more sincere. So I think sincerity, if you're, you know, like sit there, um, as you're, 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 you know it's your turn <laughs> to come and talk to them. The sorry for your loss, thinking of something. You know, I remember when your mom danced on the picnic table. <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff just and I, helps. Yeah. I found that that's why my, my note writing, um, I would, we go to the wake, you go to the funeral mass or you go to the service or sometimes now there's no service because of the, of the pandemic. Right. I would find myself, and I'll tell you, I'll write two rough drafts before I have what I need to say down. And I think... In, in the card, that way when I see the person the next time, I have already established this line of, or I'm gonna follow up with you, I'm gonna, you know, I, it, and like you say, funny anecdotal stories are really, yeah. uh, I, get, I mean, our grandkids weren't even there, they weren't even born, and they still, every time, especially the youngest one, tell us the story when Uncle Teddy knocked the beehive out of the tree. And that's like a legend in our family. So it just gets, it's it's beautiful, and you know, that they can do that. Yes. Is there anything else from Zoom or the audience? We thank you for, for listening. It is recorded. It will be up in a couple of days, hopefully to the website, um, so that you can, um, maybe if it's been hard to talk about your own personal story, listening to theirs recorded might help. Um, you can even accidentally put it on and go, oh, what's that? <laughs> Um, for to get the conversation started. And speaking of conversations, next month, January's presentation is um, something surrounding the conversation project by our own Dr. Dan Kimball um, to have conversations about planning. Um, Theconversationproject.org, you can go to that site and get prepared for some questions that you might have after this presentation. We again thank Comfort Keepers for sponsoring the event. And I'd like to end by thanking our one board member who will be leaving us at the end of the year, Wendy Kirshner, for many sponsors to our organization for these presentations. And her service is much appreciated. We are also having a fundraiser, <clears throat> boxofburks.com, 
where you could go and send a little taste of Burke's Tasty Cakes, meaty pet pretzels and so forth, to someone who maybe can't get out and get those, and a portion of those proceeds would come to us, and that's running through, I believe, I forgot the date, December 18th, but it's on the website, where you could ship them to or pick them up locally. Thank you so much for attending today. We really appreciate your time and attention. Thank you.